Okay, so let's start on time so that all the presenters have enough time to present their work. So um, welcome to this first part of the session on uh, dictionaries and lexical databases. Nowadays, almost all dictionaries are also lexical databases, so maybe it shouldn't be a separate session anymore. But anyway, we have some very interesting talks in, in this first part. Um, and um, we start with uh, a talk on the Open Dictionary Project by Tyler Lick Nickerson from uh, Linguistic Inc. So, Tyler, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Uh, hopefully this opens up, all right. Um, is there a way to make this full screen? All right, awesome. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I'm Tyler Nickerson, and uh, today I'm gonna be talking about the Open Dictionary Project. We have uh, a lot to get through, um, and only 20-ish minutes to do it, so I'll try to, uh, to keep my introduction short and uh, be mindful of time. Um, but yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, I'm Tyler. I'm a programmer from the United States and the co-founder of Linguistic, an online platform for AI-driven digital language immersion. Uh, and just to kind of uh, visit that term for a minute, uh, what is AI-driven digital language immersion? So our platform allows you to expand your working knowledge of a foreign language through online immersion. So reading news articles, listening to music, watching TV, uh, movies, and uh, adding recent advancements in AI uh, to that to build a curated learning experience around that. Um, and so that's certainly a lot. I'm more than happy to talk about it kind of one-on-one after a talk. Um, but uh, just for now, one thing to know about us is we never wanted to settle for translations. And you'll see with a lot of language learning platforms, they kind of use translations as this middleman or shortcut to kind of just communicate what is being said in a foreign language. And as a language learner myself, I know that there's so much more to learning a language than just what is being said. There's the how and why of what is being said. And so it's always been my philosophy that, you know, dictionaries are a language learner's best friend. Uh, you know, when I was learning Chinese, I, um, I always had a learner's dictionary in hand. And so uh, for linguistic, where we want to really help people understand the how and why of the language they're immersing in, um, dictionaries are very important. And we wanted to incorporate dictionaries at linguistic. Um, there were a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, you know, the most straightforward might just be, you know, take lexical data and stick it in like a relational database that is hosted somewhere, which seems kind of overkill. Um, especially if that data is not you know, dynamic or changing in any way. Um, and so kind of turning to uh, static dictionaries, but also dictionaries that can be available offline, my mind went to a bunch of different places. Um, the first and foremost being Apple dictionaries, you know, like the dictionary app you have on your Mac. Uh, <laughs> you know, why can't we just use the format from that? Um, and then digging a little deeper, you know, there are other formats such as the text encoding initiative, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, there's the DIC format um, from the 1990s. Uh, and then more recent things such as Ontolex um, and Lemon. And just, you know, again, uh, regular database, SQLite. You know, why can't we just have like an embedded database? Um, and kind of investigating these different approaches uh, we hit certain roadblocks. Uh, Apple Dictionaries is a closed format, but even if it wasn't, uh, I, you know, I found some uh, an engineer that reverse engineered the format, and it's effectively just uh, DIC, glorified DIC format, which uh, also wouldn't work for our purposes because DIC is HTML based and really has unstructured data. Um, as dict is more of a key value store and uh, dictionary definitions using the dict format, um, especially if you are familiar with things such as star dict, 
you know, it'll be in HTML, which just gets rendered in a dictionary application. Um, and so very inconsistent between different, uh, different dictionaries. TEI is a plain text format uh, used for representing lexical data, but if we wanted to index it or perform any kind of lookup, anything like that, we'd still have to use some sort of database. So that sort of ruled that out. Um, Ontolex is great, uh, very complex. I myself am still trying to wrap my head around like Spark UL. Uh, but more importantly, Ontolex uh, does not offer uh, offline support, um, which again was important to us in the event we wanted to support kind of offline dictionaries um, you know on devices uh, and then sqlite similar with you know other hosted solutions like postgres there's just a lot of overhead in managing your own diction or database just to store lexical data in it um, and so that led us to the open dictionary project uh, abbreviated odict um, and so what is ODICT? ODICT is an offline first open source dictionary file format and command line tool. Um, that command line tool allows you to manage, uh, so compile, write, um, look up words uh, in ODICT dictionaries from the terminal. And you can also uh, look up terms programmatically uh, via official libraries for languages such as Node and Python. ODIC prioritizes speed, readability, size, and portability, uh, emphasis on portability as, again, all of the data in ODIC file is structured. Um, there's no reliance on something like HTML or just arbitrary text. Uh, and so it's layout agnostic and can be used anywhere. Uh, what is an ODIC? I feel a little obligated to mention this, um, seeing there is a lot of prior work in this field. Uh, ODICT is not attempting to match the robustness of TEI or similar formats, even though it has uh, an XML component to it. Um, TEI is great for representing a whole wealth of lexical data beyond just dictionaries, and we're not attempting to compete with that. Um, ODICT also isn't attempting to create linked data trees like Lemon or Ontolex, uh, as it's just beyond the scope of the project itself. Um, and I have a demo here, kind of walking through, uh, walking through the command line tool. Um, and this is not what I expected, but okay. You just let let me live, man. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Hopefully this. Uh, Renders okay, and the sound is okay. Um, I may need some help increasing the volume here because I'm not sure where the volume is. Yeah. All right. Probably it's a dictionary using XML, and it's. All right. Okay, so on the left side here, we're defining a plain text ODIC dictionary using XML. And to walk through it really quickly, so at the top level, we're defining this root dictionary tag, which is what will contain all of our entries and all of our head words. Uh, this particular dictionary only contains one entry, which is the English definition for the word kitten. And one important thing to note here is the term is case sensitive. So if we had two definitions, one for kitten with capital K, one with a lowercase k, they would technically be treated as separate head words in the dictionary. Entries have etymologies abbreviated ETY. Inside each etymology are word usages, um, often called word senses. And usages are denoted by their part of speech. ODIC has a collection of Enum values, which are used to represent the different parts of speech, in this case, N refers to noun. Inside usages, we have definitions. Definitions can also be grouped using the group tag, although it's not shown here. Uh, and that's really just for grouping related definitions kind of under a single umbrella. Inside definitions, we have example sentences uh, with fairly recent addition to the, the schema. Okay, so jumping over to the ODIC TOI, we can have a look at uh, what can we do with this text-based dictionary. 
So the first thing I'm going to show you is the compile command, um, which contains parentheses. And what this will do is take our XML and compile it to a compressed binary based OBIT file. Next, we can look up headwords in this compiled dictionary. Object, and then we can see it in there. So you'll see we get this kind of pretty printed definition in our terminal. If we want something a little bit more machine readable, we can pass in a format flag and get it back as JSON. We can also get it back as a XML snippet um, from the original text based dictionary. Moving on, um, if we want to do a little bit more with this dictionary as opposed to just looking up head words, say we want to uh, do a full text search and get a list of all of the definitions that match a certain query, we can take any part of this definition. So let's just say the part of the, uh, what is this, etymology, I think. And we just do obit search, obit search, obit search query. Uh, one thing to note here is that dictionaries do need to be indexed before they can be searched, and the search command will index a dictionary for you if it hasn't already been indexed. Uh, but if we do want to index it without searching, we can just call obit index. Okay. So going back to the obit CLI, uh, we can take a look at some other commands here, some of which I can't demo. Uh, a good one that falls under that category is split, which will split a query into its findable terms. This is most helpful when dealing with languages such as Chinese, where you know part of a word might uh, have a definition, but the full word doesn't. And so to use English as an example, though, um, say we're looking up hot dog and specify a split threshold of three, meaning each definable term is at least three characters long. And there isn't a definition for hot dog. What this will do will return you the definitions for hot and the definition for dog uh, as two separate entries. Dump will take a previously compiled dictionary and dump it back to its original XML. Merge takes two compiled dictionaries and merges them together. Uh, one more helpful command, uh, which I can demo, is lexicon, which will print out all of the head words in the dictionary. So if we do say like lexicon, this, and it's only one head word, but you see it gets printed here to get me. Um, and lastly, I think I'll just close with demoing. Um, so I have uh, all of English dictionary saved to an obit file. Um, it's called tiny.obit. So I'm going to look up kitten in all of English dictionary, and we can take a look at uh, how to reform this tree. So if we do obit look up in kitten, you'll see in under a second we're able to get a definition. Um, and what's also great is you can look up multiple words um, here, and it will parallelize the lookups, and so it doesn't actually have an impact when the table lookup. You'll see here this is even faster than the previous run. Um, and this returns definitions for kitten, dog, and cat. OK, so uh, skipping back over to the presentation. All right. Um, yeah, so what is next for the Open Dictionary Project? Um, there are a lot of different uh, exciting directions I think this can go. Um, the first of which is something that is actually written. Um, I just have to test it a little bit more and then can, can release it, but is WebAssembly support. So being able to call the native uh, ODICT library directly from web browsers, you can see a screenshot of it here, um, being able to return definitions uh, from a compiled ODICT file. Um, an idea I've spoken extensively about uh, with a friend of mine is building an online web portal similar to Wiktionary that is backed completely by structured data. Um, and so being able to crowdsource uh, bilingual dictionaries and make them freely available uh, as ODICT files. Uh, support for other markup languages. This is something that actually came up um, when this presentation was getting reviewed, which is, you know, in place of ODICT XML, could we use something such as TEI um, or similar 
markup language uh, to represent the dictionary. Um, and so it's definitely something that can be explored. I think right now um, feature parity is very important between you know what is uh, available in the markup and what actually gets stored in a compiled dictionary, um, which is just one of the reasons that hasn't been uh, previously looked at. Um, also, uh, distributed binaries. Um, and so in order to invoke ODICT from uh, languages such as Node or Java, um, you need to have the CLI already installed on your machine. And so I think it would be great to be able to pre-compile ODICT for different operating systems such as Mac and Windows and ship it with those libraries uh, to you know, avoid that extra step. Um, and greater programming language support. I think a, a lot of ground has been covered uh, by um, you know, supporting Node, Java, and Python, but there are a lot of programming languages out there. And so uh, it's definitely something I think that can be pursued. Um, all right, cool. And right on time, it seems like. Uh, um, happy to answer any questions. Um, I know this is has been a lot, but uh, yeah. Thank you. So, any questions? Thank you for this interesting presentation. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever run into issues when you're uh, parsing um, English Wiktionary. Um, sometimes the entries are not all standard, and how do you deal with that? And the other question I have is, what's the importance of portability? Yeah, so I think, um, so to address the first part of that, uh, in terms of parsing English Wiktionary, uh, fortunately a lot of the heavy lifting has been done. Um, the demo I, I showed is based on, uh, I forget the name of it, um, but it's open source on GitHub. Um, there's been ongoing work to uh, make English Wiktionary as well as some other monolingual versions of Wiktionary available as JSON. And, uh, and so that was converted to the ODIC format uh, for this demo. Um, and so it's definitely tough though. And I know that the dumps that they provide in JSON aren't perfect. And you can actually view some of the, uh, the parsing errors on their website um, if you know, uh, data sets incomplete. Um, yeah, and so a second part of that uh, portability um, so portability is very important, especially as you uh, deal with, um, uh, well, I mean, there are two different ways you can look at portability. Um, and I think in the world of kind of startups and product building uh, that I come from, um, you know, not everything uh, is always going to be web-based all of the time. And in fact, being able to add web views and whatnot, especially to mobile applications, you know, can be a performance hit. And so being able to, uh, to represent data as something that is not just HTML that needs to be rendered in order to be viewed um, basically allows you to you know, build things like mobile apps without having kind of that HTML web view component. Um, and on top of that, I mean, by having just sole structured data that isn't you know, based uh, as just unstructured HTML, um, it opens the door to more possibilities in terms of like what uh, you can do with machine readability and things like that. And so um, being able to better understand that data. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, one question, have you thought about adding any embedded hi historic uh, or version control features to your tool, or is it better to leave those to third parties? Yeah, that's actually a great, uh, great point, um, and not something that's been uh, thought of very extensively. I think theoretically, if you use something like Git, I mean, you could version control it that way. Uh, obviously not the uh, the best way to uh, version control binary files. Um, but that said, uh, ODICT uh, does support um, at least 
dictionary major versions. Um, and so like, you know, if a breaking version of odict comes out, uh, it can't be used to read like older files. You have to like dump those files and recompile them. Um, and so there is some semblance of, I think, versioning at least on a format level. And so I think it'd be really interesting to be able to uh, maybe add tools into the markup that help you kind of uh, create versions or even, you know, create dictionaries that store multiple versions. Um, so definitely something that could be explored, I think. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I, I guess I've got two quick questions. So one is, could you talk a bit more about the relation between the data model that you're using and, you know, the file format? And second, can you say a few more words about the indexing? Yeah, so uh, just to make sure I, I got that. So the relationship between the like XML markup and the compiled file, is that right? And um, indexing you mentioned, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, um, and this kind of ties into what I was saying about support for additional markup languages. I think right now um, it's very easy because the, the core library is written in Go and being able to, uh, you know, use Go's uh, built-in marshalling to be able to, you know, convert that XML to a structured data model inside the CLI, and then being able to use that um, and use, so the format uses Google's flat buffers library to serialize that to kind of um, a byte buffer. Um, and so that supports, uh, you know, a hierarchical data structure, very similar to, you know, Go structs or XML. And so it all really flows together nicely, I think. Um, and then as far as indexing goes, uh, so indexing in full text search is operated by uh, the Go Believe library, which is just a full text uh, index. Um, and I think the one limitation of indexing uh, as it stands right now that uh, especially makes it hard to do similar things like uh, for WebAssembly is uh, indices are stored on disk. And so it you know, creates a temporary directory uh, on your file system that stores the, the generated index at a dictionary. Um, and you don't really have file system access in a browser uh, in that same way. So it's kind of hard to index, I think, in a browser. But yeah, so that's, that's roughly how indexing works. Um. Exercise for you. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I had a very similar question as Milos. I mean, the, the data model. I mean, you mentioned Ontolex, and Ontolex is a is a model for um, originally not for lexicography, and um, and they have also some um, uh, extension models on the way on corpus frequency and kind of things, and morphology and uh, and other modules that might be. And there, it's very important to have those uh, linked data principles. And um, so I, I was wondering why you don't go for putting your uh, JSON in LG JSON and so have this interoperability uh, possibility. I, I don't think it's very far away to give uh, your rise to all your elements. And then you would go to a graph representation for sure. I'm not sure it's a net way. Are you able to just clarify the question for me? Just get, I, I just didn't catch everything. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no in one of your slides you say you don't want to go for linked data. And I was wondering why, because it would, I think it would be easy from your JSON to create, uh, you could transform things in your eyes and to be interlinking to other resources. I don't think it would be a, a big step to do. Yeah, yes, uh, apologies about that. But uh, yeah, I mostly, you know, uh, you know, I'd rather be too conservative than too overly ambitious and say, you know, we're going to, you know, uh, be on track to like replace existing, uh, you know, data models, things like that. Um, but I definitely think, you know, it is a possibility, as you said, I think it, having structured data and being able to use stuff like JSON, it does open the door to being able to have kind of like linked data trees and, uh, you know, better representation of that data. 
Um, I think it would just it would need you know some thinking around it and and some exploration um, as well as just kind of talking to people about you know how they would want to see the format used or how they'd want to use the format, um, which I'm happy to talk with anyone about that uh, that wants to chat about it. But um, yeah, so I think it would really be based on on demand and need. So. Thank you, the speaker again.